I've been asking the question in the little article in the paper and in Facebook, uh, did God kill Ananias and Sapphira? <laughs> and I've been getting some interesting answers. I'll read a few of those for you in just a moment. But I want, first of all, I want to read you the account from the scriptures. And I must confess to you that even as a teenager, when I read this in the scriptures, I always felt sorry for Ananias and Sapphira. It may be that we are supposed to be on Peter's side, but I always felt sorry for Ananias and Sapphira. In those days... I'm starting, to, no, I'm starting in the wrong chapter. Now, a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said to him, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold and after it was sold? Wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but you have lied to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all those who heard this. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. After three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, tell me, is that the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are all at, are at the door and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and she died. And then the young man came in and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. Now, that's a good story to read just before you pass the plates. <laughs> and we also know that that's what the story was used for in the early church when preachers were trying to raise money and get that last, that last bit in. But I think you probably recognize that there are some problems with the story. I've known that since I was a kid, since I seem to be on the wrong side of the story. I've gotten a number of answers to that question. I'll read you just, uh, just a few of them. Just a few, because I've gotten quite a few. Uh, well, this is not an answer to the story. This is just someone who sends us greetings. Uh, said, we worship online almost every Sunday with St. Matthew United Methodist Church, and we enjoy the message and the music so much. Thank you. And that's some folks in Keller. Here are some answers to the story. If remember this congregation, Diana E. says, no, my God doesn't work like that. Uh, Max Thompson, who is a former student of mine, says, since you asked, it sounds like a story made up to scare folks into doing their tithe. Mark Brundage, another youth of mine from another youth group, said, no, I think this is a case of man corrupting the word, of his, uh, the word to serve his ends. 
And Beth Ensor, who is a Methodist minister who came out of this church, says, no, God didn't kill them. <laughs> Perhaps it was their guilty conscience. We look for some way to explain how these two people died. Were they elderly and the word just hit them so hard? We look for ways to explain it because the truth is, well, I'll talk about that later. Paula Kaufman says, Beth Ensor, my thoughts exactly. And... Um, Jim Reeves, the guy who used to put the uh, write, write for the Star Telegram, says, the God that Jesus brought us didn't do that. Sounds more like some Old Testament guy to me. And um, David uh, McKee Wiser Land says, it is a mystery, uh, an object lesson on lying to the Holy Spirit. Well, I, I don't know. Uh, how many of you think you may have at some time lied to the Holy Spirit? Uh, my hand is up. Yeah. And uh, if we each got struck down every time we grieved God or sinned, well, none of you would be here. <laughs> we, we, we have questions with that. Uh, here is someone, uh, uh, Robert, uh, in, uh, Robert in, uh, uh, in uh, I, think, I think that Robert lives in, in De Leon. We got several friends there uh, who, uh, who is waiting uh, patiently for, uh, for the answer uh, to come. And there is a person here who says, yes, indeed, God did definitely kill Ananias and Sapphira, and he lists several other people in the scriptures that God has killed on the spot for doing something God didn't want them to do. Well, let me give you a little bit of background and tell you something rather unfortunate. God does not stop us from making mistakes. You probably know that already. If you've been around for a while and have made a few, God does not keep us from making mistakes because that's the only way we're ever going to learn. And that's why we're here in this world to learn. We could have just stayed in heaven where everything is easy, but God has put us here where a lot of stuff is not easy and where I hate to tell you about this. If you're not careful, you your meniscus can tear. This is not an easy place to live. Let's face it. And that's deliberate. And we're going to make mistakes. And God is not going to save us from those mistakes. And the early church made a mistake. Excuse me while I sit down again. They tried something that didn't work. <laughs> you know, they were, they, were, they were in joy after the Pentecostal experience. And they thought, we can do anything. So one of the things they did is they decided to live communally because they had gotten the impression, here's another mistake, that the Lord was coming soon. And therefore, they could afford to do this. And they, this is also in Acts, just before what I read to you. They sold all of their possessions and they lived a communal life. And it sounds like a beautiful idea, but the problem is what happens when you have a church full of people who have gotten rid of everything they've got and given it to the church and time goes on and on and on, and then you've got a church where nobody has anything. And, but you still got the church, and you still love the Lord, and you still have to keep on doing it. What you've got is of all of the churches, of the early churches, Jerusalem became the poorest they were miserably poor, and they had also done a good deed. They had taken in the widow and the orphan to help them, and they did not have the money to live and to function, and their people didn't have any money because a lot of them had sold everything they had. And 17 years after this happened, the apostle Paul 
had a meeting. He went to Jerusalem, he said, uh, as he was called by the Holy Spirit and had a meeting with the leaders of the church. That's Peter, we know him, and James, we know him, but you may be thinking about the wrong James, and John, we know him. Now, the James we're talking about here is not James the disciple, but James the brother of our Lord. And he was actually the leader of the Jerusalem church. And by the way, James was quite conservative, and let us say it, he did not get along all that well with the Apostle Paul. And so the Apostle Paul came to Jerusalem and had a meeting with them, and they told Paul, it's fine the way you're preaching to the Gentiles. They had only one thing they would ask him, will you please, when you go from church to church, will you raise some money and send it back to the church in Jerusalem? And if you read the whole end of the uh, second letter to the Corinthians, you will see Paul you will see a preacher in fundraising mode. I mean, he is begging and pleading and encouraging the Corinthian church. And by the way, the Corinthian church was quite wealthy. They had a lot of money. He is asking them to get things ready. He said, uh, he said, he said he hadn't called on them to do this before. He's even called on churches that were poor, like Macedonia, I think, and they have given abundantly. So he's doing all he can to raise money because he's going to have it sent back to the poor church in Jerusalem. It was not a good idea, and it didn't work out well. And actually, Ananias and Sapphira, although they did lie about what they gave, they might have about been kind of smart about it because they may have felt this didn't work. But how do we know this did not go down the way this story tells us? How do we know it didn't go down this way? First of all, that boy Peter doesn't look very good here. He looks pretty, pretty hard-nosed. I mean, here he is, instead of having any concern for Ananias. Here is Peter <laughs> saying he's going to drop dead. And you remember, you remember Peter's situation? Peter was the one who grieved for years over a sin much greater than Ananias and Sapphira committed. While the Lord was having the bejesus beaten out of him and Peter was standing by, three times he denied that he even knew him and that denial hung over Peter like a weight for years. We can tell from passages in the scripture that it, it bore upon him. Peter is not the kind of person who would play self-righteous with somebody because they sinned because Peter knew what it was like to sin. And poor Sapphira. In this story, Peter has no concern for the fact that this couple who loved each other, that her husband has just died. This is the thing that's important. Her husband has died. If her husband, in fact, died, if this story gets that accurate, what a sorrow, and her husband is dead. That's not what he's concerned about. He's concerned about getting rid of her, too. And Peter just didn't act that way. I, why did Luke get included in the Scripture? Because it is a good story. I mean, it is a dramatic story. I mean, if you saw it on film, it would, be, it would be riveting. It's a good story, and Luke knew a good story when, when he saw one. But Luke also included this in his gospel, these words. God is kind to the ungrateful and to the wicked. Not mean God is kind to them sometime, but God is always kind to all of us at all times. We're having this near-death study, and there's one thing that we learn from looking at near-death events is that people, people go there expecting to be condemned, and they find that they are loved in spite of their sins. I saw one just last night. 
there was a father who had gone to sleep while he was driving and rolled the car. He was very honest about why they had the wreck. And he had his wife and his two children in it, his young son and, and, and their baby, just a few months old. And his wife and the baby were killed. And of course, he was, <laughs> he was out of it for a while also. He was in heaven for a moment after the crash. And his wife told him, you've got to go back. You've got to go back. Well, he did go back. But later he had an experience as he lay in the hospital covered with this, not only his physical injuries, but his extraordinary grief. And suddenly he had an experience while he was in the hospital. And he found himself in this place. He saw no walls. He saw nothing but a light shining from above. And it was shining down on a crib. And in that crib was his baby, looking well, <laughs> looking, looking beautiful. And he went over to the crib, and he was filled with joy beyond belief. He picked the child up. He said he could feel the child physically in his arms. He said he smelled the child's hair. He could smell the hair. It was his baby. He held it against his breast. And he rejoiced at having his son in his arms again. He could physically feel him entirely there with him. And then he was aware of some figure behind him. A huge overpowering figure and he said he knew who this was this was God and all of that guilt came back upon him the guilt of his negligence and every other sin he had committed in life he felt it and even with his baby in his arms he was weighed down by it and he knew that figure was coming closer and closer. And when God reached them, he wrapped his arms around them both, father and son. And there was nothing to regret. There was nothing to forgive. There was only love. We cannot even imagine how much God loved Ananias and Sapphira. I don't know what happened to produce this story. If you want to find some stories a lot worse, look in the book of Revelation. God did not control people in their freedom to write it, even the blessed Luke. And, you know, after I get to heaven and touch the hem of our Lord's, the hem of our Lord's gar garment, and then I'm going to ask <laughs> to shake hands with the Apostle Paul. The next person I want to see is Luke, who gave us the Good Samaritan, uh, the prodigal son, the Gospel of Luke. Oh, how I love him. But yeah. It's a good story, and he stuck it in there. But remember, whenever you read, even in the script, listen, the Apostle Paul told us, if an angel from heaven were to come and to proclaim to you a different gospel from that one which I proclaim to you, Paul says, Paul says, do not believe it, because there is no gospel in which God does not love each of us infinitely. And whether you find, you hear a story or you find one in the scriptures in which God is not loving somebody, that didn't happen. 
because God loves us infinitely. And the love that we're going to meet when we get over there, people tell us, cannot even be put into words. It is so profound, so overpowering, so all-consuming, so unconditional. I have a guy that writes me every week. I've told you about him. He's the guy that said, yes, God killed them and God killed a lot of other people. And he doesn't actually understand what love is all about. He, said God, he says God makes us a love offer. A love offer. He doesn't love us yet. He offers us love, and if we straighten up and do the right thing, God will give us that love. No, it ain't so. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. As we are, God loves us. As we are, it, you may not think it's fair that every sin you have ever committed is already forgiven. And it isn't fair. God is not fair. God is unconditional love for us and nothing can break that love. So anytime you hear any story about God being unloving, that's not what Jesus told us. Jesus said, love your enemies, love those who do not love you, love those who persecute you, love those who treat you badly. Why? Because the only saving power in this whole world is love. The only thing that gets us through life is love. The only thing we will find that counts when life is all over is who we loved and how we loved and whether we loved. It's the only thing that counts. So Ananias and Sapphira, Bless their hearts. They've been gone a long time. <laughs> they were loved just as much as you and me. <laughs> Peter is not a mean, hard-nosed guy. He was a great apostle. And what I wish that you and I could feel right now, in spite of every failure in the book that we may have committed, is that we are loved. And everybody <laughs> that we love there are loved too. Because love is what it's all about. And here is a scripture you can carry to the bank every day. God is love. Now, struggle with it. What does it mean to be loved by God? It doesn't mean that all of our difficulties disappear. It doesn't mean that life is a bed of roses. It simply means that whatever life is, we are loved and we have the victory and we are headed in the direction of his grace. And one day he will receive us and wrap his arms around us. And we will know that we are forgiven in his love.